Again, I said what I said on the broadcast. I had no problem saying it. I stand by it. But what happened after that? Not so great. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Monday but Tuesday edition this week of Fair Territory. I am Ken Rosenthal. I am coming to you live from San Diego, where tonight I'll be part of the broadcast for Game 3 of the Division Series between the San Diego Padres and the Los Angeles Dodgers. We have what has been so far an extremely entertaining playoff, an extremely entertaining postseason. All four series right now, all four division series, are tied at one game apiece. What that means is that the lower seeds in each case now have home field advantage going forward. It's a best two of three with the next two games at the lower seeds ballparks. So what I want to do today is go through each of the series, kind of in a brief way, but rank them in order of which higher seed has the most pressure on it. So we're going to go one through four, actually four through one. We'll do this more dramatically. We'll count backwards and we'll kind of dissect each series along these lines. Which of these teams has the most pressure on it? Would it be the Guardians? Would it be the Yankees? Would it be the Dodgers? Would it be the Phillies? That's where I want to go with this because frankly, we've got some big money teams, some high profile teams that right now I don't know that I'd say they're in trouble, they're not on the brink of elimination, but it's certainly a little dicey as these series shift to different sites. So let's start with number four, the fourth most team under pressure. I would say that in this situation would be the Cleveland Guardians. During the regular season, if you remember, the Guardians were only seven and six against the Tigers. And I know the Tigers, of course, had kind of a tale of two seasons. Their first part of the season was, I don't know, kind of a nothing season. They sold at the deadline and they came on late. We all know the story by now. It's one of the great stories in recent years in baseball. And here are the Tigers on Monday doing what they've done all season, winning a game behind Tarek Skubal. He was brilliant. Seven scoreless innings. I believe it was eight strikeouts and no walks. That's pretty good. That's ace-like material. And then the amazing, dramatic, captivating home run by Kerry Carpenter off Emmanuel Classe, only the third off a Classe slider in his career. So this stuff is really cool. But I don't know that any of us would have said going into this series that the Guardians were overwhelming favorites over the Tigers. The Tigers have played as well as any team for two months now. And again, the season series was relatively close. So if the Guardians lose this series, it will be extremely disappointing. They've had a great season. But at the same time, this Tigers club the way they go about it with their pitching chaos beyond Scooble in a short series they can pull this off in a best of seven I think they're going to have a hard time so I've got the Guardians as my fourth most team under pressure third on this list I would say and this might surprise you is the Los Angeles Dodgers the team that spent a billion dollars last offseason isn't the one under the most pressure actually I would suggest no because of their pitching injuries remember they have lost this season 12 different starting pitchers or had 12 different starting pitchers on the IL and when you are in that situation and now facing game three with Walker Bueller on the mound who has been inconsistent game four you're likely looking at a bullpen game I'm sorry the way the Padres are playing and this kind of season that they've had this will not be a shocking upset if the Dodgers lose here in fact a lot of people believe the Dodgers are going to lose and believe that before the series even started The Dodgers clearly are a team that is built on their offense. And what is going on right now? Mookie Betts is in another postseason slump. Granted, a small sample size, 0 for 6. But this goes to 0 for 22. And then it goes to 3 for 44 if you go back in other postseason series. Mookie acknowledged yesterday that he's feeling it. His manager, Dave Roberts, said he's feeling it. And, of course, it's not just Mookie Betts in a tough situation. It's Freddie Freeman. Freddie Freeman is physically compromised right now. He had to come out of game two because of his ankle. So two of their big three, Freeman and Betts, are not who they are supposed to be. Their pitching is not what they thought it was going to be. I don't know that I can say the Dodgers are under the same kinds of pressure as the other two teams I'm going to mention. Number two on my list, that would be the Philadelphia Phillies. And the Phillies, no, they didn't spend as much as the Dodgers. They haven't. Their payroll isn't quite as high, but it's high. And beyond that, this is a team that has talked all season 
about avenging what happened at the end of last season when they had a three games to two lead on the Diamondbacks at home and could not close out the NLCS. This has motivated them from the earliest days of spring training, even going back to the offseason. This is a team that has talked about wanting to do bigger things. They win their first division title since 2011 this season. And yet here they are against the Mets, kind of the Tigers of the National League, clearly more talented. At the same time, they're the hot club right now. And the Mets are going home to City Field, which will be raucous, which is always anti-Phillies. And the Phillies need to kind of wake up here. This is a team that offensively has been streaky and inconsistent. Now, this is not the end of the Phillies' window if they don't win this year. They've got four players, Wheeler, Nola, Turner, and Harper, who are signed for at least three more seasons. Real Muto and Schwarber have one more year each. Yes, most of their stars are in their early 30s, so this is not going to go on forever, and the clock is ticking. But again, this was supposed to be the year that this team kind of did some big things after its disappointment of last season. All right, so that brings me to number one on my list of most under pressure, and that would be the New York Yankees. And why do I say that? Not just because of their $300 million payroll. I say that because of the column I wrote and what a lot of people thought once the Astros and Orioles were eliminated. The Yankees have a clear path, or seemingly had a clear path, toward their first American League championship since 2009. The rest of the field right now includes teams from the AL Central, teams with one-third the Yankees' payroll at best, and the Yankees have an extremely talented roster. There's no doubt about that. So when you look at the fact that the Astros are out, their postseason nemesis for the last decade, the Yankees' postseason nemesis, they're out. The Orioles are out, a team that faded, granted, but a team that has given the Yankees problems in the AL East the last two years. Right now, the Yankees' opponent is the Kansas City Royals. The Royals are no slouch. Don't get me wrong. They are a team that puts the ball in play. They've got the highest batting average right now of any team in the postseason. And they are a team also that has at the top of its rotation Reagans and Lugo and Waka, and it's a pretty impressive group. So, again, no disgrace to lose to the Royals if you're the Yankees. But here are the Yankees in their one year of certain control with Juan Soto, kind of playing the way they've played all season, which is not great. They have been a team that's been sloppy at times, a team that has been inconsistent, and you have Aaron Judge, their big star, in this postseason so far, one for seven, four Ks, two walks, him and Stanton combined. Those two guys are two for 16. Soto's done a little bit more. The Yankees have to slug. It's like the Dodgers. They've got to score runs, and they're not doing it. And Joel Sherman of the New York Post had a great stat today on Judge. In his postseason career, in his plate appearances, 33.8% of them, more than one-third, have ended in a strikeout. That's the second highest rate ever for a player with 200 career postseason appearances. Granted, I always believe this, and this is true for Betts as well as it is for Judge. Give a great player enough chances, and he's going to succeed in the postseason. The problem is, in both cases, these are short series. You have to produce in a limited window, and it's not happening. Also with the Yankees, Cole was not great in Game 1. Rodon was not good in Game 2. These are things that, hey, you're paying these pitchers a ton of money. The two of them combined, I believe their contracts total almost $500 million. Short sample, I know, you still got to produce. So the Yankees, to me, are under great pressure here. The year where a clear path emerged for them to get to the World Series. And right now, they're in jeopardy of not getting there. Time now for the Inside Dish, the part of the show where I talk about maybe something I've written, maybe something I've said on the broadcast, maybe a trend in the game, maybe a big star who is in the middle of controversy again, and maybe kind of a combination of all of those things. Today is a combination of all of those things. The other night on the broadcast, in Game 2 of the National League Division Series between the Padres and Dodgers, I took note, as a lot of people did, of Manny Machado and the meeting he called in the dugout, the emotional meeting after all of the tumultuous circumstances that were taking place on the field. Machado called that meeting, got everyone together. It was reminiscent of the David Ortiz meeting, going back years, the Hunter Pence meeting with the Giants. These things do happen from time to time in the postseason. It kind of speaks to the importance of the moment, and it speaks in these cases to the leadership of the players involved. In Machado's case, 
he was trying to calm down his team, make sure they stayed focused. And having covered Manny his entire career, having remembered all of the incidents of the past, and we'll get into some of them in a second, to me, this was a big step forward for him. It was a show of leadership. And on the broadcast, I said, over his career, he is taking criticism for being too laid back, for occasionally being a dirty player, for being the kind of player that teams do not want to build around. And I said also that what he did in that dugout was the most visible and powerful show of leadership in his career. Now, I believe that in the moment. I believe it to this day. I wrote a whole column about this entire situation today in The Athletic. But of course, moments after I said that, I learned about what happened earlier in the game with Jack Flaherty and the ball being thrown and all of the things that have since been reported and transpired. The information about Manny throwing the ball toward the dugout came out in the post-game clubhouse when Jack Flaherty was speaking to reporters. We asked Manny about it. I was in the Padres clubhouse at the time, and it became a big thing. And then the next day, this was Monday, during the off day in the National League Division Series, Dave Roberts said the ball was thrown actually at him. It was unsettling. It was disrespectful. The Dodgers sent video to Major League Baseball, and here we are in the middle of another Manny postseason to-do. Now, I mentioned the past with Manny. This goes back many years. There were situations, of course, the Dustin Pedroia play where he was accused of a dirty slide. There were situations where he had a bench-clearing incident with Josh Donaldson, another one with Jordan Ventura, a number of things early in his career. And, of course, the 2018 National League Championship Series was his classic heel turn. He was doing something seemingly every night to tick off the opposition, dirty kinds of things, and it was just the low point of his career. Didn't stop him that offseason from getting his $300 million free agent contract. Also that offseason, I was the one who conducted the Johnny Hustle interview for Fox Sports. And I'll play you a clip now. I know it's memorable for a lot of people, but let's refresh our memories by showing exactly how that went down. How would you explain it? What happened? I mean, honestly, Kenny, I mean, I'm not the type of player that's going to be Johnny Hustle and run down the line and slide to first base. That's just not my personality. That's not my cup of tea. That's not who I am. Should I have given it a little more effort? hundred percent. I should have, but I didn't, you know, and I got to pay the consequences for it. It does look bad. It looks terrible. So a lot of people, of course, jumped on those comments not realizing the full context, some of which you saw there. Machado took accountability for what he had done. He vowed to be better. He knew that it was a problem. And I had written a column the night before kind of previewing this interview that what was going to come on television, trying to brace everyone and give the full perspective of what he was saying. And people can take it however they want, but it wasn't as bad as saying, I'm not Johnny Hustle. There were more things said. There were other parts of that interview and he did take accountability. Now, let's go fast forward to the broadcast the other night and what I said. When I speak, when I write, and I do anything like this, I am mindful of everything that's taken place before, and I am also, though readers and listeners and viewers might disagree, I'm always kind of trying to be fair. That's what I try to do. I try to give all sides, try to be fair, and again, considering the breadth of Machado's career, all that had taken place, that moment in the dugout, that was pretty cool. Obviously, again, I did not know about the rest, and obviously the rest matters. And all the things that have taken place since that we've learned about the incident with Roberts and all of that, that reflects poorly on Manny Machado. There's no question about it. That seems to be who he is. In my column today, I wrote, this was Manny being Manny again. He is a guy who is not afraid to get under people's skin, not afraid to rattle cages, He'll do it. Fans of other teams are going to dislike him intensely for that, and that is their right. Fans of the teams he plays for, in particular the Padres now, love him. They love him because he's the emotional leader of this group. He is the guy who, while having this unbelievable contract, remember they signed him to a $350 million extension to replace the final six years of the $300 million contract. He posts, plays every day. Since 2015, he is second to Paul Goldschmidt in games played. He's out there. He's trying. He's playing mostly at a high level. He's a great player. He's a Hall of Famer. And the Padres fans understandably like him, love him, and they love this team. 
His team has guys who will tick people off. Profar, his antics out in left field and at the plate and whatever he's doing. Tatis, he's a guy who prances around like a peacock. These guys are emotional players. They're guys who have fun playing the game. But if they're not on your team, you're not going to like them. This is who the Padres are. This is who Manny is. And what I wrote in the column and how I'll conclude this segment is by saying two things actually can be true. He can be a leader and he can show growth, which he has shown. He was really helpful and supportive of you, Darvish when you Darvish was on the restricted list while attending to a personal matter. Darvish has said, hey, this guy was right behind me. He was there with me. He was one of the most supportive players. He can be that guy. He can be the guy that calls the meeting in the dugout and rallies his players. And he can also be the guy who does things that can really tick you off. None of us is a one-dimensional person. And to me, the Manny Machado we saw the other night, for all of the frustration people might have with some of the things that we've learned since, at the same time, if Jack Flaherty in 2015, or the version of Jack Flaherty then, had said what he said to Manny Machado after striking him out, Manny Machado probably would have charged them out. So we've got growth here. We've got more maturity, albeit starting with a low bar. And again, this is not a one-dimensional situation. No person is that one-dimensional where you can say, good guy, bad guy. Well, actually, some people are. I don't know that Manny is. Manny has multiple sides. And in the column I wrote, the headline describes the multitudes of Manny Machado. That's an accurate description. Again, I said what I said on the broadcast. I had no problem saying it. I stand by it. But what happened after that? Not so great. We'll be right back after a word from A.J. Pruszynski, Eric Kratz, and Scott Braun. I love a great deal, but I'm not going to run sprints in the outfield just to save a few bucks. It has to be easy. No hoops, no BS. With Mint Mobile, it really is that easy to get wireless for $15 a month with the purchase of a three-month plan. Purchase and activation is super easy, too. To get started, go to mintmobile.com territory. All plans come with high-speed data and unlimited talk and text delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. You can use your own phone with any Mint Mobile plan and bring your phone number. To get this new customer offer and your new three-month premium wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com territory. That's mintmobile.com territory. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com territory. $45 upfront payment required equivalent to $15 a month. New customers on their first three-month plan only. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes on unlimited plan. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Time now for Grilling Ken, the part of the show where you guys get to ask me questions. Let's fire up and get going. First question today comes from Jim W. Miller, who asks, I know the reason is ratings, but do you think that it's fair that the Yankees always get the primetime game. Other fan bases miss their teams with early games, and teams have to play with crazy shadows while the Yankees get all the breaks. Owners should complain. Jim, the reason is ratings. There's no question about that. And frankly, it's more of a problem, in my opinion, for fans than it is for the teams. When you talk about the shadows, both teams are playing in the shadows. I, I don't think there's an advantage there. There's nothing that's affecting the game other than the shadows themselves, which ideally you don't want. Ideally, you want the games all in prime time, but then they'd be bumping up against each other, and that's not going to work. Evan Drellick wrote a story in The Athletic recently about why they stagger the game times. That's what produces the highest ratings. And as for the Yankees themselves, do they get an advantage playing at night and in prime time? I don't know that that's an advantage. I do understand and empathize with fans who are unable to watch games that their teams play during the afternoon for whatever reason. They're working or they're out and about, whatever the case might be. There are other fans, of course, who complain that all these games are at night and end too late and they should be played in the afternoon so the kids can see them, always the children. There's no easy answer. But the bottom line is this. The networks pay billions for the rights to these games and they're going to adjust them, baseball is, to work with their partner here to get the best possible ratings. That's the way it is, that's the way it's always going to be, and while it is unfair to certain fan bases who get stuck every year, well, their teams, if they're in every year, have to adjust and have to kind of miss work or miss school, whatever the case might be, it's just reality. All right, the next question, this one comes from Mad King Tyler, who asks, what do the Orioles need to do to succeed in the postseason? They have been swept the last two years in the wild card round, 
Is it just more experience in October? Or is there a price they need to sign or trade for, a piece they need to sign or trade for in the offseason? It's kind of a little of everything. One thing that hurt them this year were the pitching injuries to their rotation. They didn't have Bradish, they didn't have Grayson Rodriguez, but even if they had had those guys, where they suffered at the end most was the offense. And that to me is something that you have to address perhaps with a veteran piece or two. And I know people are saying, well, look at the Tigers. They're a young team, one of the youngest in the league, and they're doing just fine in the postseason. Yes, that's true. They're a little bit of an aberration. Generally speaking, you kind of need more presence. And you need these players to mature. That's part of it, too. Jackson Holiday in two years is going to be better than he is now. Even Gunnar Henderson might be better than he is now. All of these guys, Kobe Mayo, the group of prospects that they have. Remember, Westberg got hurt at the end, too, just came back right as the postseason started. No easy answers here. And obviously, they're going to have a challenging offseason because Burns is a free agent and Santander, one of their veteran players, who is kind of a stabilizer, is going to be a free agent as well. Really, you just have to keep going. And you kind of have to learn from your experiences and mature as a group and grow. And that has to be supplemented as well by bigger and better players. It's the bottom line. All right, final question. Rick Bentley asks, I'd love your take on Tito Francona. As a Reds fan, am I wrong to be excited for the first time in a while? Rick, good question, and I'm glad you asked it because we haven't even touched on Terry Francona's hiring, which was one of the great shocks of October so far. No one, well, not no one, but not many people thought he was coming out of retirement. I certainly didn't think he was after all the health problems he had and all the reasons he gave for stepping down with Cleveland last season. But Francona lives for this. We've talked about it on foul territory, and yes, he will be a big addition for the Reds. It's a man who's been a three-time manager of the year, been in three World Series, won two of them. He has a great way with people, and even a great way with young people, though he's not young anymore himself. Tremendous communicator, seems to get the most out of his players on a regular basis. He certainly did it in Cleveland all those years. So for Terry Francona and for the Reds, this is a huge step forward, and I am excited to see what he can get out of that team. That is not a team without talent. They obviously have some holes, they have some things to address, but going forward, I expect them to be better because he is their manager. I want to thank everyone for watching, everyone for listening. YouTube, Spotify, Apple, that is where to find us. And we'll be back on Thursday with our normal Thursday show, 1230 Eastern, myself and Alana Rizzo. Enjoy the postseason, everyone. BetMGM bullpen jackpot, special for the postseason. You can win a share of a daily $50,000 BetMGM bullpen jackpot and bonus bets if the player that you pick for a home run in that game hits a homer that lands in an MLB team bullpen, either team, right, in that particular ballpark, and then prizing will be paid out in bonus bets that expire in seven days. Gambling problem or concern, call in your gambler. Hey, everybody. Be sure to like and subscribe for more content. Fair Territory airs each week, and we'd love for you to become part of our community. Here's another video you might enjoy. See you next time.